there. Good evening. Welcome to the Bronx Buzz. Uh, this is Bronx Nets program where we talk to reporters and writers and editors and um, journalists and all different people who are writing about our borough of the Bronx and our city of New York. And uh, just to try to give you some insight as to what they think about while they're uh, writing. Uh, and in our second segment, we usually do arts and culture. And um, this evening, we are going to talk to a Bronx opera singer who is just an absolute delight. So we'll do that in our second segment. But to get started, we're going to meet and greet somebody we have never met before. It is um, Gabriel Poblete, who is a, a Report for America reporter for The City. Gabriel, nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Hi, nice to meet you, Gary. Thanks for having me. Well, we're thrilled to have you, and I'm always thrilled to talk to uh, young reporters. A little bit about your background. Um, How did you get into journalism? What what inspired you to do <laughs> this horrible thing? I don't know why I got into this. I just know that my um, senior year in high school, I had to decide on a career, and I went to journalism. Um, and then I stuck to it. I did, like, you know, I weaved in and out of it, but I've been um, a reporter for the past four or five years. Um with a stint at Cooney's um, graduate school for journalism. Um, did you did you grow up here in this? You say we went to high school were you here in the city or somewhere else? Uh, no, I'm so I'm from Miami. Um, oh, and okay. I lived there most of my life. Um, I went to school for journalism up in Florida in Gainesville uh, mm-hmm. at the University of Florida. Yeah, and um, yeah, and then I you know. I right. uh, and and um, how, how's it been? I mean, you know, converting from being a student to actually doing it for you know uh, publications, whether they be online or otherwise. Um, what's it been like? You, you uh, feel feel good about it? Is it difficult? Is it what you thought it would be? Um, just some uh, personal impressions. Yeah, I mean, I would say. I mean, I came. I went to graduate school during the pandemic, and that was a decision just to kind of get that master's degree and. Um, what a good way to spend the pandemic when nothing else was happening. You may as well do something for yourself, right? Makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. And I had yeah. been working at a business journal in Miami, but I just felt like I wanted to kind of go back to school and learn things I didn't know. Um, and I spent the first semester, um, well, the first two semesters of three, mostly uh, taking classes online um, through Zoom. So I'm kind of familiar with this format. Um, I don't know. Some people think I have no legs, but no, but it's been great. And we I think we the, choose not to speculate. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but the, no, but J school really did prepare us for um, just kind of going into the workforce right away. And it's been great. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think let, I, let me ask you about um, working and doing journalism in New York City versus, let's say, Miami. I mean, has New York City been interesting for you? I mean, I can't imagine it's not. Um, yeah. But but um, uh, this is really, um, you know, every street corner, there's a full news story you could do, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the sheer size of New York and it's 8 million people make it such an interesting place to report. Um, there are things that are so New York in terms of, the government apparatus such as like the community boards which i find to be like a fascinating place to just uh see like hyper local government at work right. and mm-hmm. so i mean i don't know i think new york has been great and um yeah i mean and there's so many people to know in positions of power and just like everyday folks that it's just um I don't know if anyone has a big enough brain to just like wrap their mind around. Uh, I um, I probably have been working here in the Bronx doing TV as long as you are uh, old. And um, uh, I can tell you it's endless. And it's one of the thing that fast, one of the things that fascinates me because you can just do, you know, you, you just keep going and you'll find new stuff literally every day. Anyway, let's really talk about the um, migrant crisis. Um, we did want to establish that we do record these um, earlier. So, this, you know, things could change from today to tomorrow. We understand that. Um, but um, wh- where did we get started here? You uh, reported that the city braced for uh, the new wave of asylum seekers as t- Title 42 expired. Um, just just talk about where we were and now where we are. Yeah, I mean, so this migrant crisis stretches back to summer of last year and this all came into focus because the uh, city's shelter system had been reaching its capacity. And sometime in the summer of last year, Mayor Eric Adams said that the reason why the shelter had such uh, little capacity left was because there had been an 
influx of migrants in recent weeks um, that have been coming from the border. And at that time, um, New York, I mean, um, sorry, Washington DC had been receiving a lot of migrants from the borders that were being sent there on chartered buses um, by um, Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Um, at that point, we didn't really know whether that was happening to New York City, but the mayor speculated that that was what was going on and why the shelter system was so filled. But that really kind of jump started like what became this migrant crisis story. Sure. Uh, let, let me just move it forward. One of the things that happened here in the Bronx was the, the first notion that they were going to house them at Orchard Beach in the parking lot. And that didn't go well. And it spurred up a whole dialogue. I mean, I remember that was like at the beginning of it. But you wrote recently, which I thought was, I, I can't even get my arms, or my, my head around it, um, that um, asylum seekers are now arriving by airplane. They're, they're flying them over and they're coming in and LaGuardia Airport? Yeah. So, I mean, I kind of went out there because there are these uh, people who have been helping out the migrants who have said that, you know, too many eyes were focused on people coming through these chartered buses, but they were arriving through other means wow. as passenger bus um, riders and also by plane. So I went out there um, a little over a week ago and I checked out and indeed, um, you know, there are many migrants coming wow. into the city by air. And yeah. and so what what that does is so let's just say around the port authority that they deal with migrants who are coming in and they have some processing uh, you know um, situation but they don't have that at LaGuardia Airport so those people come in and it's like well here you are and you, you know what it's like when you walk through the the terminal and you're just in the new city these people have got no place to go I mean uh, um, is is there um, a, a plan now to at least set up some kind of center or something like that to assist no that I'm aware of there isn't a plan yet to help out the people that arrive at LaGuardia or the other regional airports yeah um one of the things that um, is shocking and striking to me it's not shocking but it's striking I understand from every perspective, that, okay, so now they want to put them in school gyms. Well, I understand parents who may even be sympathetic to the migrants are saying, wait a minute, I understand you got a problem, but we don't want them where our kids are going to school. It just complicates that whole situation. Is there any way to just deal with this um, uh, on, on a, a larger level? Or are we just continually going to, you know, uh, rubber band here, rubber band there, rubber band anywhere we can to find places for them? Yeah, I mean, so the city, and there might be more at the time that this airs, but the city's already opened over 140 shelters, yeah. um, emergency shelters to deal with the migrants. There's been uh, more than roughly 63,000 that have entered um, the city's shelter system. And around 40,000 or so are still within the city's care. Um, so yes, for now, the city's response has been to band-aid it by opening shelters and shelters. That mayor um, has called on the federal government to provide more assistance. And um, I mean, in many cases, while New York City has been one of the cities that's really felt the brunt of this, this is like an international um, immigration kind of issue. And um, I mean, to solve this, maybe this needs uh, or requires um, movements in the U.S. Congress. Um, yeah, I, think, then, I think federal support becomes a very big uh, concept. I mean, yeah. uh, because there's just no way the city or even the state of New York, with its history of wanting to welcome immigrants, and certainly people have come into our shores in New York City from all over the world, um, but, you know, there's got to be a way to deal with it. And if they, you know, maybe you could construct a building or a place to house them, but who's paying for that? I mean, you know, it, it becomes a very, very, very um, big uh, issue. Um, for you, um, in terms of what you cover, is this the kind of thing that you are inspired by? Are there um, subjects that you like better than other others to um you know, to, to, to cover and to work on, or is this really one of the things that just motivates you to do what you do? Yeah. I mean, I would say I didn't expect that I would be covering immigration issues in New York City <laughs> when I started this job. No, nobody uh, expected it. <laughs> you know, if they yeah. expected it, they'd have had it, they'd have had it figured out, you know? I mean, it's been interesting to cover it. Just, um, you know, I, I kind of, my parents immigrated to the country. Uh -huh. 
I come from Miami where there were already a large uh, number of Venezuelans entering the city. And many of the ones that have now entered New York City are Venezuelans who are coming here um, uh, to escape a country that's kind of roiling and, you know, uh, a lack of economic stability and um, with a president that many people say is um, a dictator of sorts. Um, so yeah, I mean, so I think um, it's been very interesting to cover the migrant crisis. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm there's tons of other things I'm interested in, but you know, I try to tackle you're, a lot you're of them. You're doing this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, I, uh, something else that you wrote about, um, the city was uh, apparently closing an area in Port Authority um, where volunteers help migrants. Uh, I mean, it seems to me you'd want to open those kinds of areas. Um, do we know more about that? Yeah. So since the migrants arrived in buses, they've often um, made their way to the city and gotten off in Port Authority, where there's been kind of this um, ad hoc welcome center for now months, where they kind of get the essential steps that they need to kind of make it through the city and get connected with shelter. And um, even so, when the buses stopped coming with such frequency a couple months ago, migrants would still go to Port Authority for help. Um, so what's happened in recent um, in recent days is that the city has decided to shut down that center, um, kind of like minimize its footprint in Port Authority and just divert the buses as much as possible to these other respite centers, um, as they're being called, one of which is nearby at the Roosevelt Hotel, if I'm not wrong. Um, I, I think that is where it is. That's not exactly near uh, Port Authority. I mean, let's, yeah. let's face it, you're still getting people, I think it's about 14 or 15 blocks away. Um, yeah. So that, that was curious. So I guess the, the idea was they didn't want Port Authority to become that kind of a center because of all the people that crisscross it. But it doesn't help the people who just arrive here figure out what they ought to be doing, I guess, you know. Um, yeah. Any, anyway, we are just about out of time. Um, Gabriel Poblete, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to keep reading what you write for The City, and um, we hope um, we're going to invite you back. Once you're here once, you know, you're a captive, and we'll get you back here at some point. Um, yeah, so, well, happy to come say? back. Though. Great. Yeah, happy to join again. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your great work. And uh, as I said, we'll keep reading you and we'll uh, look forward to having you back. We appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What we're going to do, folks, we will take a short break. Uh, when we come back, changing gears, uh, we're going to greet um, one of them, I think one of the most delightful people in the Bronx, and you'll enjoy uh, meeting uh, Linda Calazzo, who is an opera singer. Uh, we'll be right back. You can talk to me if you're feeling sad. Thanks for hearing me out, bro. Whenever you need to talk, I'm here, okay? Que color. Perfecto, mijo. Gracias. Thank you. What's wrong, mijo? Donating to a pet's medical care is one of the many ways you can help families in your community. Pets and people belong together. Learn more at petsandpeopletogether.org. Man, it's lonely. Like, going through life lonely. There is the therapeutic aspect of music, just expressing how you feel. I'm going to talk to Howie about his feelings, make it into a song. and dads. What you have achieved here today is going to help us and our futures. It is why we are coming up on stage to collect your diplomas. You know it's true. Mom, we love you always. Everything I do, I do when you graduate, you. they graduate. Visit finishyourdiploma.org to find free and supportive adult education centers near you.
fostering a pet for a friend or neighbor can keep families together. Learn more at petsandpeopletogether.org. Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. I am just so thrilled because she's a friend and she's incredibly talented. She is a mezzo-soprano. She's a music teacher. Uh, She is my friend. It's Linda Colazzo. Nice to see you once again, Linda. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Do you, do you wake up in the morning and just start singing, like do a little opera? Or does it take you a while to get a little, get yourself going? Um, it, t- it depends on if I have work, you know, right now I'm taking a little bit of time off, but when okay. I'm working a lot, I'm like, you know, I wake up and I start doing lip trills and I start wow. humming immediately. Well, that's wonderful. And, and what, what really um, energizes me is your passion for, for the work. And we're going to talk in the second part of our um, segment here uh, about your teaching, which is, of course, passing it on is is vitally important, especially in our home borough of the Bronx. And so I want to ask you about playing at Carnegie Hall and singing at Carnegie Hall. And I'm going to start the conversation with, how do you get there? Of course, you practice, you practice, you practice. Um, tell us a little bit about um, how you got to Carnegie Hall, aside from all the practice. Um, wow. I mean, years of hard work. I mean, I started when I was 13 singing at LaGuardia High School. That's where I learned how to sing opera and connections. You know, um, once you start singing, it's amazing. Like even in college, you know, you will meet people who will go all over all all kinds of places and they will remember you if you, you know, were excellent um, back then and if they see your track record. So one of my peers from from college remembered me and he works for this company called choirs of america and they perform at uh carnegie hall all the time and he just randomly emailed me one day asking if i could sing there and at lincoln center so it was really and, uh, and you said no i don't, I don't think i want to do i don't want to i don't oh want to sing God, in those no, places as soon as i i got that email i just like was like yes i'm so honored thank you so much yes please and so what was the context of the i mean i Unfortunately, it wasn't, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Linda Colazzo presents, but was it in the framework of another um, a program of some sort? Right. You know, what was that like? Yeah, it was. So it's called Choirs of America. It's it's now called Harmony Tours, Choirs okay. of America and Harmony Tours. And it's a really, you know, wonderful company where they bring together tons of choirs from high schools across the country to perform at Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall. So I functioned as like the teaching artist, young artist, um, where I just performed in between sets like when they were transitioning on and off the stage. So it was just me and the piano and um, literally I sang for like 30 minutes. Uh, wow. yeah, so, but before we even get to that, um, and did you choose the pianist and did you choose the material or yeah. did they say, well, you're going to do this and here's your piano player. I, I picked my pianist and I picked my repertoire, um, mm-hmm. which was really fun for me. Cause I do love Spanish music in, in the classical canon. Um, and that exists. A lot of people don't know that exists. So I got to sing a lot of Spanish music. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, your own evaluation of how it went? I mean, it was nerve wracking. I, I will. What, say- was it? Was it? Was the place filled? Were there people in the audience? Yeah, no, there were a lot of people. There were a lot of people, and then also the students were watching. So that was really exciting. You know, the students. It's always fun to sing for students because they're like especially like inspired so and enthusiastic, was- especially yeah. if they see a young person who they can relate to, like like yeah. you. Yeah. So it was like really fun in that respect. Um, I will say, oh my God, Carnegie Hall was so dry. Like every time I went off stage, I had to like drink hot water. I had to like, yeah, like my mouth was just completely Is that because you were nervous? I know. I think it was just the hall. And and I spoke to one of my coaches afterwards who's like worked there before. And I was like, that hall is so dry. And she was like, yeah. It is. Wow. Um, yeah. The other thing I want to ask you, and I'm, I'm going to give you a personal thing of goodness gracious, goes back <laughs> into the 70s. I saw Paul Simon at Carnegie Hall. We were seated all the way in the upper, 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 the cheap, you know, the, the $2 oh. seats. Well, that was okay. But I had had a, um, a, a, a broken ankle at the time. So I was allowed in early. And we walked in and nobody was in the hall. And Paul and his band were doing their sound check. And so we were like, and Paul saw us enter from downstairs and he said, oh, it appears they're letting people in. So let's cut it off. I heard him talking on the stage all the way upstairs. And I was like, the acoustics in this place are amazing. 
did you find or did, tell me about the acoustics in there did you did you um, find some stuff like that so uh, i've sung at carnegie hall before in the chorus so i already okay. knew that the acoustics were like bonkers <laughs> but like to sing there as a soloist it was really funny like when i first came out and i sang my first piece and like i had the applause i literally looked at the ceiling because the ceiling is so high and that's like where the sound bounces off from and that's why the reverb is so like great and i heard my own echo and i li <laughs> i literally i don't know if i can like curse here but i literally mouthed the words oh I was like, <laughs> like while I was up there in my gown, I was like, wow, because it was, wow. it was really, it was really amazing. I was like, kind of like wow. taken aback by it. You, you know, they say to people who uh, make announcements like at, at the Yankee Stadium or City Field that you have to be careful because you, if you speak too fast, you know, it, it starts to conflict with the echo. Uh, did you have to uh, adjust anything, or it just other than uh, keeping yourself hydrated? <laughs> No, I mean, there's not much you can do because, right. you know, I didn't have a mic and like I didn't like, you know, um, you, you did have a mic. I didn't. So wow. like there was, there was nothing wow. I, could, I could do. So. It's just this is amazing. Yeah. So all I could do was was just stay. Wow. That, that yeah. is um, just amazing. Um, you had family and others there who were like, oh, my God. Yeah, it was really like a powerful moment. I did have wow, a lot of wonderful. family and friends. Um, so one last thing. And then I do want to talk about your teaching. Um, do you have other performances? You had said a uh, Lincoln Center. Is that is that something? Yeah. Too? So with the same company, I I did perform in April last month at oh, Lincoln I see. Center, um, and that was like really that was actually it was it was, it was like really a, memorable. Oh, I was going to say it was disappointing compared to Carnegie Hall. No, it oh. actually it was bigger. It was a bigger deal. It was big. It was a bigger deal. Oh, yeah. so I asked you all the wrong questions. What was no, that like? No, it's okay. It's okay because you know. Carnegie so wait, did you were you in the Opera House? Were you in the opera house? No, I sang at uh, Alice Tully Hall. Okay. Um, but it was very memorable um, and, and important because I got to work with this composer who is very like uh, famous now. He's one of the, the few famous, you know, living composers. Wow. His name is Dan Forrest and he writes many choral works that I even sang in college. And I was a soloist for his piece called Jubilate Deo. And then the conductor his name was Craig Hella Johnson. He's a Grammy winner. And I, I mean, like, it was kind of crazy. Like, they were such kind, humble, sweet people. Wow. It was one of the most beautiful experiences. Like you, like you, like Aww. you. <laughs> I, hope, I hope so. You know, it's, it's very easy to develop an ego in, in any entertainment industry. Sure. Here you are at Carnegie Hall in Lincoln Center. Um, now, listen, before we run out of time, so you have voice and piano lessons um you um uh you, now you've been doing this for a while yeah i've been teaching since i was 18 uh-huh so it's been nine years <laughs> not that we wanted to ask how old you were <laughs> and and what do you, what why did you start doing it? i guess it's a way to make a, a couple of dollars but yeah. um i know that you have passion for it yeah i mean especially in the bronx you know um, you know how it is especially in hunts point <laughs> the south yes. bronx there's not much like uh there's not there are not many businesses that mm -hmm. provide you know arts education and even in our schools like i don't think they're as frequent as they used to be you're correct yeah so you know it's interesting i ran into a guy who um does guitar lessons uh, uh just the other day and i was asking him we should get all the independent music instructors together he said the problem is that there are large schools now and so anybody who, who's like looking for music rather than get the one-on-one -on -one and the, the real individual instruction that we could get from somebody like you he said people are going to these music schools um so what do you teach do you teach only opera or any kind of singing or to let, talk about the range of stuff so i like working with beginners because you know i think that um, people associate being a musician or knowing music with like being a star and being an expert. And I personally have the philosophy that anyone could play music, you know, even if it's not like you don't sound like Mariah Carey, like you could still hold a tune. You know, I, I am a personal believer that anyone can do that. So I like to work with people of all ages. I like to work with... I, I want to just interject yeah. all ages, so it's not yeah, only with, children. Yeah, work I work with, with adults. all ages. I, I love working with teenagers and adults. I even like work with people who are retired sometimes. And those are like the most 
uh, fun and enjoyable because I, I get to talk to them about life and just see like them develop a hobby that's really beneficial to their life you know like music isn't all about like being the best and being a star like music is also really good as a pastime and it's just good for for your mental health and for your- absolutely and, and it's it's self-fulfilling i mean i know um if i have stuff that doesn't make me happy i'll take a walk in the park and get my earbuds on and hear music and at the end of the walk i say you know what now i'm I've got a new perspective uh, on my life. So um, if people want to uh, contact you, and I hope they will, we need more. I mean, we invented all the music in the world. I know that in the Bronx. But um, if people want to um, learn music, learn piano, learn to sing, feel better about themselves, how do they get to you? So they can just email me, Linda Colazzo Mezzo at gmail.com, but also my website has a lessons tab. So Linda Colazzo.com slash forward slash lessons. Um, and then you can see like reviews and also like my work, my portfolio, things like that. Um, but that's mainly how to That's read. how to do it. Uh, I'm so I'm gonna offer a review right now. Do it. She's the best. Oh, uh, is that, does that work for you? Um, now, now, listen, we know each other a long time. You know, you know, I'm going to ask you to sing me anything, anything, anything right now. I know you, you didn't do your exercises or anything like that. Uh-huh. S- sing anything just so people can hear how beautiful okay, you sing. Okay, okay. Uh, anything. Been a long time. Sing <laughs> opera? Okay. Very good. I didn't want to have to cut you off, but we are running out of time. Linda, you are just a joy, a joy of light for all of us and for people of the Bronx. Music, let there be music. Let there be music with Linda Colazzo. Check her out. Uh, uh, you know, get, get yourself some lessons. Meet up with somebody who's really special. And uh, listen, Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, winning a Grammy. Every time that happens, you let us know. Okay? I hope I don't know. I don't. I don't know if I'll ever win one. But oh, <laughs> if they ask me to vote, I vote yes. Aww. Listen, when I if, if when I sing, they say. You're kind of like Bob Dylan, but not as good. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, listen, you're the best. Uh, Take care. Be well. Say hello to your sister, Patty, who I know very well. And we'll see you around town. Bye. Thank you. See you later. Okay, that should do it for uh, the Bronx Buzz. Uh, I am uh, thrilled that we got to um, speak with a couple of young people this morning, or this evening, actually. And um, we'll see you around town.